Great, thank you, Andrew. Thank you for that first panel and thank you, Amy and Chairman Connolly previously for the great discussion leading up to this second panel and final panel for the day for Government CIO's Media and Research IT Modernization Webinar. Really excited to bring this panel to you. Um, this second panel is focused on 5G um, and how data is being brought closer to the edge connecting more IoT and Internet of Things devices and reducing response times to fulfill the mission. So we have an exciting 40 minute panel um, lined up for you with some esteemed members of uh, industry, government and public sector. Um, we have Scott Bowman, Deputy CIO, FEMA, Matab Mdadi, uh, Regional Sales Director, Dell Technology, Keith Nakasoni, Deputy Assistant Commissioner for Acquisition, Office of IT, GSA, and Dr. Ryan Vega, Chief Officer for Healthcare Innovation and Learning, Veterans Health Administration. And I'm your moderator, Mark Renama, uh, Vice President, Government CIO. Really excited to dive into this discussion today. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. So let's just go ahead and dive in and we'll start with just a general question about um, considerations um, that uh, your agency and or organization um, are, are looking towards for as it relates to network modernization and 5G. So uh, why don't we start with you, Keith? Thanks, Mark. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, one of the things that GSA is doing is, you, you know, we were um, among our uh, partner agencies working on the implementation plan for the Secure 5G. And uh, one of the activities that we are concentrating on is the acquisition piece. Uh, when we look at things from a whole of government approach, we really wanna capture all of the requirements and, and build out those acquisition solutions to accelerate the process of um, injecting emerging technologies such as 5G into, into the uh, infrastructure. So a um, couple of activities um, that we are focusing on within the implementation plan is the um, assessment of global competitiveness and uh, the economic vulnerabilities um, from, a, from the United States manufacturers and suppliers perspective. Um, that's in partnership with the other uh, agencies such as DHS, FCC, Department of Commerce, uh, as well as us. So we're, we're looking at the supplier, blade, su supplier base. And in addition to that, what we're doing is we're looking at how can we um, accelerate that delivery? So, so when we look at unclassified, classified IT systems, we're, we're, we're figuring out how to build these acquisition solutions in the, in the, and figuring out that acquisition process so we can move things along a lot quicker. So from a whole of government, best in class acquisition solutions perspective, that, that's kind of what we're doing from our seat. Great, great. Thank you, Keith. I appreciate that. That certainly gives some perspective to the upstream of acquiring these technologies. Let's, uh, let's just shift over to you, uh, Dr. Vega. So uh, obviously the role of uh, the Veterans Health Administration has changed uh, a lot with COVID and the pandemic in the last year. Um, can you share some of the considerations that um, you and your team um, are, are looking at um, with re respect to network modernization 5G? Yeah, Mark, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. So you know, I sit much further downstream uh, as a healthcare practitioner and sort of in the healthcare innovation landscape. Our OINT department is really leading some incredible modernization efforts, both digitally and within our network. From a healthcare standpoint, and, and particularly, I think this was happening prior to the pandemic, but certainly accelerated as a result of COVID, we're seeing the need for more distributive models and modalities of learning, whether that's training young clinicians or young providers, whether it's engaging with patients more in their home. And the idea that more care, particularly more acute care, is going to be delivered in the home, that more devices are going to be connected and those devices are going to be telling us things about an individual's health, and in this case, veterans' health, veterans' well-being and wellness, I think is, is not something you know, that's going to be in the future. It's happening today. And, and really, you know, what 5G enables us to do, whether it's, it's sort of optimizing the network and slicing and even some of the, the, the capabilities and the advancements that it brings to LTE networks, the, the notion that you're going to have all of these devices that are operating on different types of frequencies or, or different um, types of bandwidth that can now begin to sort of play better together, right, in essence. And what that means now for the patient's own ability to be in the center and the control of their care, um, as well as for clinicians to better connect. And when I say connect, this isn't just virtually. 
but really the evolution of physical connection, tactile connection that can actually be made possible by, by 5G changes the paradigm of what we think of as a physical exam that's uh, encountered virtually. Uh, and so I think what, what we're literally sort of diving into is, is the use cases that are going to be enabled by this technology, whether it's advanced AR and VR for surgical navigation or patient education or training, and really trying to sort of move the needle forward and, and begin to embrace, I think, what, what's happening within the healthcare landscape, which is this shift to more distributive models, both of learning and, and of care. And, and who knows what types of innovations we'll see as a result of this type of network capability, uh, but, but it's certainly exciting to see it unfold. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rega. Yeah, absolutely. You have to imagine the, the implications to telehealth um, are, are right here in front of us, as you said, really, really exciting times. So that, that's really interesting. We, we got an acquisition perspective. We also got a healthcare perspective. So let's go over to Scott um, and hear some of a maybe emergency response uh, perspective and, and the FEMA agency. Yes. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm excited about where uh, industry is headed, uh, where we're all headed. It's, it's amazing as we look back over the years, uh, how, how far we've come in such a short amount of time. You know, we're in an era where we can go to the data while remaining connected uh, to back-end systems and also make decisions uh, at the edge. Uh, and as the data um, you know, moves to the edge and resides on the edge. The, the computing and software workloads are also moving to the edge as well. So it enables us to turn things around faster, uh, especially within FEMA. Um, it, FEMA, we're continuing to improve our disaster response capability as these technologies evolve. Um, when I started at FEMA 20 years ago, um, 20 plus years ago, uh, cellular networks nationwide didn't exist. Um, we didn't have the coverage and speed that we have today. Um, you know, what we have today is amazing compared to what we had back then. Um, so one example of how we've been able to dramatically improve our time frame for assistance to disaster survivors is with our housing inspectors. You know, back then, 20 years ago, um, the inspectors had to use dial-up. Uh, so they were all analog. Uh, they would typically communicate once, maybe twice a day. Uh, so the turnaround time uh, for those inspections was measured in days, not hours. Typically, they would communicate at night, get their inspections that they had to do the next day, uh, go out and do those inspections and not communicate again until the following evening. Um, so, it, you know, it was 24 plus hours, at best case scenario, to get those inspections done. And Nowadays, they, they walk around with handheld tablets that are connected to cellular and they're able to continuously communicate, sending and receiving before they walk into a house to do an inspection and sending the results immediately after they walk out of the house. So that's, you know, reduced our turnaround time to, to hours, not days um, for those housing inspections, which help, helps get assistance out to the disaster survivors faster. Another example is our disaster survivor assistance program, uh, where we send uh, staff out to the communities with cellular devices, and they can literally sit there with a disaster applicant and in real time look at the status of their registration. Whereas before, you know, 20 plus years ago, the only option was uh, call up to our call centers and, and ask for information on the status of your case. Now. Uh, that can be done uh, immediately, either our disaster survivor assistance staff or people can check it on their own via their smartphones. So it, it's quite a difference from where we used to be. And, and we're looking forward as we move uh, towards 5G. Um, with more data on the edge, we're considering you know, those devices and endpoints untrusted. Uh, and all the compute actions must be you know, role-based, immutable, least privileged. Uh, so that we ensure that we're protecting that data. Uh, and we do so with security in mind using a risk-based risk -based framework and, and implementing the tenets of zero trust. So nothing is trusted and we must secure that data on the edge. We're not just worried about securing the data back in our data centers today. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, that was really, uh, really 
beneficial. Thank you for that answer. It's really interesting to think about how quickly technology changes and looking at that from that perspective of healthcare that Dr. Vega shared with us and then emergency management, you know, in some way, shape or form, we're all in the business of facilitating um, rap change to rapid technology and adjusting to rapid technology changes. So um, really, really exciting times. We've got some very unique perspectives from three leaders in the government sector. So let's hear from um, our panelists in the private sector, um, Mata. First of all, you said my name perfectly, very impressed. So I am very excited to be here today. I think uh, being on the industry side, we're in a very unique position to see how this data era is impacting our customers across several different customers. So what I've noticed is that the impact of 5G and AI, IoT, it's, it's rippling across a whole organization. It's impacting IT, it's impacting security, it's impacting workforce, digital communities, um, and it's really bringing IT closer to the mission and the business. Um, from an IT perspective, I've seen a lot of our customers have to go through a major transformation um, where they were solely relying on you know, a cloud computing architecture or a data center architecture, where now they have to move to a federated architecture, which um, it seems like we're always kind of going back and forth from dispersed to consolidated to dispersed, but um, we're back into the federated distributed world. And I think that that's a move that a lot of our uh, customers um, have been able to do easier because most of them do live on the mission edge already. So. That's one perspective. Of course, um, as the architecture grows and expands, security's job gets a lot harder and the attack vector just grows exponentially. Um, and every single device that's collecting data becomes a, a, an attack zone. So I think the security has had to modernize and figure out new ways to mitigate against this new emerging landscape of uh, vulnerability. I think the workforce, um, the workforce, especially in this pandemic, has been impacted. It, work is something that everyone does mobily now. I think um, Dell has officially closed down, I think, goodness, like 30% of our offices permanently. So um, everyone's expecting to be able to do their job mobily. They're expecting to be able to consume data fast and um, being able to compete and differentiate themselves, leveraging data and information. So that really puts a lot of pressure on um, the developers and the digital community of our customer bases. Um, they are being asked and really demanded by the workforce to incorporate next gen uh, data architectures and services that take advantage of AI, ML, um, and are able to take all of this data that we're gathering and turn it into information and insights. So um, they have to move much faster and you know, they are leveraging a lot of acceleration technologies in the platform space. So I think the exciting part of you know, this conversation is that this 5G uh, transformation is so pervasive and it really does impact all customers and almost you know, every organization and line of business of a customer. Thank you. Thanks, Matop. That was uh, very helpful. Yeah, it's interesting. It really uh, an, an obvious common thread um, out of everything that was shared was security, right? I mean, bringing data closer to the edge um, security has to be of higher concern. Uh, and, you know, in this era of um, uh, cybersecurity issues, attacks, uh, vulnerabilities, um, obviously this is going to be a big focus. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. Let's focus on security a little bit. Keith, you're a self-proclaimed uh, requirements aggregator, I hear, I've heard, um, on the GSA side. And obviously, um, I like starting with you and having that unique perspective because the acquisitions um, that, you know, result uh, from these uh, modern technologies, you know, start with you and, and your office and your team. And so can you talk a little bit about maybe what you're seeing as far as requirements coming in from different agencies, uh, maybe to, uh, with a flavor of security and more secure um, uh, systems? Sure. Um, thanks for the question. W one of the things um, that we always have to be concerned about is the security requirements. So as we, um, as uh, I'll use this as an example, our, one of the largest enterprise infrastructure solutions, the EIS contract that, that is the best in class in delivering telecommunications uh, services and solutions is, um, is in, we, we have incorporated all of the security requirements uh, in, in the contract. 
contract. But we also have flexibility in the contract at the order level. So if there's additional security requirements that is required by the agencies, we are able to do that effort at the order level. And so what we try to do is when we build out these government-wide acquisition contracts, we try to take things from a uh, from the whole of government approach. And then when we, um, uh, the, the other example I want to provide is the multiple award schedule where we have the mobility special item number where we, we have the uh, telecommunications, IT and services that allow not only at the federal level, but state and local level as well. Right. So when when we look at whole of government and we look at extending our our um, uh, cooperative purchasing um, program efforts and best practices and requirements, we have to look at it from 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 that whole of government lens, because when we adopt and we, we say, how do we inject innovations technology a lot quicker through the process, if we if if we at the federal level can provide that information down to state and local, we would like to build those acquisition solutions so that they, they would be able to leverage what we're um, doing at, at the federal level as well. So the, that's one of the um, uh, beauty of, of building out these government-wide acquisition solutions with 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 the flexibility, and so that's one thing that we're doing. And you know, with the National Defense Authorization Act and Section 889 prohibition of telecommunications equipment, etc., we 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 can um, ensure that we have some control points within the entire process of acquiring, and that's exactly what we want to do with the uh, 5G infrastructure as well. So security is always on the top of our minds when we build acquisition solutions. Excellent. Excellent, Keith. Um, so Scott, you had brought up the topic of zero trust, um, immutable infrastructure, um, infrastructure as code. These are all uh, kind of uh, um, aspirations for many agencies, many private firms, um, and uh, people are kind of in different places on their path along this journey. Can you kind of share a little bit um, uh, more about the other considerations besides just, um, you know, the speed increases and in response times um, of network monitorization as it relates to security? Yeah, and, you know, oftentimes the, uh, the technology is not, not the issue. It's you know, implementing and leveraging the technology in a secure fashion. And, and I think that's where uh, a, a lot of agencies, especially in the government, you know, we, we don't move as fast as we could because we're following uh, security principles and a, a risk management framework that uh, is, is designed for, uh, you know, different, uh, a, a different era, a little bit slower technology pace. So we're, we're trying to to expedite that, you know, using the risk management framework as we go forward is a solid basis to ensure that everything we do is secured, um, that we take into account records management, that we take into account privacy, that we also leverage the cybersecurity aspect of it. So uh, for that, we're continually ensuring that the, the you know, the, the device is authorized. Is the device authorized and still secured? Um, so that's, you know, one thing device management is, is critical is that uh, not only the, the data is out on the edge, but that device is on the edge. So ensuring that nothing has been compromised on the device itself, in addition to the more traditional, is the user authorized? Does the, you know, do they have the right requirement to have access to the data? Um, so we're mixing those things together to ensure that uh, we're not only secured from a, an authorization perspective from the user, but also that they're operating on a secure device and that we're not letting a compromised device uh, have access to the data that we have. So we're still um, learning as we go. And it's a, you know, a continually a continual learning process, I think, for everyone as we go forward. And um, we're uh, pushing things uh, out to the edge, but we're also, you know, working that security piece of it. So uh, as with other uh, government agencies, we, we are doing it, but we're doing it slowly and in a more secure fashion, uh, perhaps than some people would like. But again, we, we ha you cannot have a, a, a exploitation of that data sitting out there on the edge. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, that that was. Uh, I, I wonder if we could shift over to Matab and get kind of a different perspective. We heard kind of the government side of it. So I'm wondering, from a private sector perspective, 
Um, you know, I, I know there are some commercial clients and private sector clients that uh, follow risk management framework and RMF. Of course, it's required on the government side. Um, I just wonder if there's um, so many different considerations um, as far as private sector versus the things that Scott just laid out. So I think that the private sector, we grapple with the very similar challenges. I think that those are ubiquitous, you know, across the board. And I think that, you know, aside from needing to modernize the way that you go about zero trust and security, the need for doing completely modernized networks and bringing compute storage closer to the edge where this data is being generated, that's really kind of the part where I'm seeing all of our customers focus their efforts on. I mean, the amount of data that's being generated today, they just can't leverage the hardware centric network environments that are out there today. They have to move completely to software defined networks and the applications out there are requiring sub millisecond low latency response times that are requiring that compute and storage to be right next to um, where the data is being collected. So um, a lot of considerations that I'm seeing our customers going through are making sure that they are going after very secure supply chain and durable compute and storage resources, um, ruggedized systems, tactical systems. Uh, we work a lot with them on similar things like that, cells on wheels, things that you can kind of move around depending on where the data is being generated. So network modernization, going to software designed um, and software centric uh, uh, networks, and also bringing that compute and storage as close to where the data is being collected is another major consideration. Thank you. Thanks, Mata. And Dr. Vega, you know, I'm, I'm most familiar with uh, the Department of Veterans Affairs myself. That's an that's, um, area I've worked a lot in my career. So I know that, you know, the security, a lot of the security um, considerations uh, for VA are coming out of OINT, especially as it relates to network modernization. But I wonder, is there, um, are there considerations for privacy and clinical um, uh, view, viewpoint of the security as it relates to network modernization? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think this is going to be an area we sort of use this phrase, think slow and act fast, because the technology is rapidly evolving. And the patient, you know, they're becoming more consumer driven and sort of deciding how they want to receive their care. And so we have to be able to meet that. And, you know, it gets really, really challenging. And I always tell the story when I was a resident, we had developed this, this really nice clinical decision support application but folks could only use it when they were inside of the hospital because it was streaming patient data. They wanted to be able to be at home or we had residents that moved back and forth between the VA and the academic affiliate. They wanted to be able to use it on the move. Uh, and we, we just couldn't figure out how to, how to make that secure. And I, I don't think that's the right answer moving forward is to say, no, 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 we, you know, we can't do this or it's gonna have to be an issued device on our network. I think from the clinician standpoint, right, it's about feasibility practicality and, and recognizing that my cell phone today has an enormous amount of data that's actually helpful about my individual behavior. How do we make sense of all of this, integrate it meaningfully into the workflow, allow it to be actionable intelligence for both me and the patient, and do so in a secure fashion? I think this is where real need around interoperability and standards comes into place, because you're not going to have the ability to just have this massively open network of public, you know, a PHI just being out there. And I think Mata really sort of isolated is the attack zones, right? You have this massive distributive network of devices connected to a hospital's network. Each and every one of those are vulnerability points for what we all consider as data. I don't want other people having. Um, I think interestingly too, it also plays within the, the walls of the hospital. How do you optimize the network so that if we have surgeons in the operating room, uh, moving MRI data into a holographic image for advanced surgical navigation. You know, that's the same network I want somebody downloading a movie on. I, I think, you know, we sort of recognize and go, well, so let's take a step back. So I think those considerations, right, it's about we, we have to think slow in, in the sense of let's be practical and let's make sure that whatever we do does not lock us in to where the ability to utilize this technology prohibits it from being meaningful and integrating into the workflow. More data for docs is not necessarily better. Uh, it's more actionable insights, right? And, and I don't want to wrap the log into another system 
or leave what I'm doing and then, you know, go to another computer to say, well, this is the only place you can get the data. So this is where a lot of think the innovation and the research is going to be needed to really embrace the technology in a way that it becomes meaningful and actionable. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's really, uh, I saw you shaking your head a lot, Matab. I'm going to come back to you. Um, so any, any thoughts on that from a, a healthcare perspective? Obviously, um, you know, Dr. Vega is working in uh, essentially the largest, you know, healthcare uh, organization in the country, essentially. Um, and so I just wonder, as far as Dell's technology is concerned um, and healthcare, um, do you have anything to add to Dr. Vega's thoughts? It's a huge fan of everything that you said, and I agree with you. I think that being very practical and, and being very um, pragmatic as you go about bringing in this new technology is extremely important. Avoiding lock-in is critical. I know that a lot of what we're doing at Dell is we're standing up 5G reference architectures that are built on completely virtualized stacks so that no one has to be locked in into any one telecom provider. So that if you are leveraging Ericsson today, you can be able to move to Nokia tomorrow. So I think being able to bring in new technology in a way where you're flexible, agile, and you can avoid lock-in is so critical right now, especially as things are moving so fast in the technology industry. Great. Thank you. Appreciate that. So, um, Keith, Keith, I'm wondering, on from what you're seeing as the requirements are coming in to acquire these systems and to move, move uh, obviously you're getting a wide variety, as we can see when, as we're hearing from emergency response view and healthcare view, you're getting a wide variety of requirements um, for the need of the technology. Um, the thought occurred, and I just wondered, you know, do you guys, uh, are there other considerations besides all the requirements coming in from the agencies? Uh, do you look to private sector commercial or anything like that to kind of make sure it's a holistic acquisition strategy, if you will? Right. And that's a great question because I was just going to go there with the um, private and public engagement that we're having around the 5G, right? So on the NTIA um, uh, web, website where the implementation plan was dropped, what, th that was the whole reason of, of the engagement because private and public engagement is so important so we can find out what are the constraints what are those unique requirements and this is the you know if we take the agile approach and we phase things in by use cases we'll be able to learn a lot quicker we can adopt a lot quicker because we can we can do these sprints a long time so if if we build the acquisition solutions in and around those use cases and those challenges that the agencies are having we're able to grapple with with exactly the specific mission requirements that each agency is trying to resolve, but there's also other things that are being lifted to the enterprise level, meaning that if we find consistency across everybody is doing it, then we can build it into the uh, acquisition process. That will that will help accelerate the process, refine requirements, but also adapt, uh, adapt to those best practices. But those early engagement and collaboration with the partners on who's delivering that capability is, is, is very key to the process, right? Because if if we can identify those conflicts or those challenges early on in the process, we're able to work through those. And, and um, we know that some of the telecommunication companies are standing up some labs. We know some system integrators as well are standing up labs. So if we, if we learn through those use cases, we'll be able to work through those nuances and deliver capability through the acquisition solutions a lot quicker. Great. Keith, that's really exciting. It's, it's good to hear that uh, the combining the best of all worlds really uh, gives confidence that it's a solid acquisition strategy um, to serve you know, all the federal agencies very well. Um, so this next question I'm gonna throw out there and anyone can kind of just uh, step up if they have uh, uh, some comments or thoughts. Um, this whole, there's a notion that you know, increasing the speeds and getting more access and bringing the data closer to the edge might prompt agencies or organizations um, to put data closer to the edge that they previously haven't put closer to the edge. So this, this could obviously raise a number of different challenges. We talked about security a little bit, but I just wonder specifically about the desire to maybe put more data, more sensitive data closer to the edge because of network speeds increasing um, and, and what considerations and impacts that might have. Uh, anybody interested in fielding that one? 
happy to throw in a couple of thoughts. Um, I, I think that the, the missions are going to require it, right? I think it makes uh, security uncomfortable. And I think that, you know, they're going to have to find ways to mitigate around it. But with the amount of data that's going to be captured at the edge, there's just no way to, with even software defined modern networks to traverse all of that into a core repository. So um, I think that a lot of applications and next, uh, next gen data applications are are very smart around what they send to a core. Um, for example, I have a video surveillance uh, system in my house right now to watch my cat when I go away. Um, it doesn't send me anything until it notices something moving around, right? And when that happens, it sends that data to the cloud so that I can look at it or, you know, similarly, if organization has the same system so that they can analyze it. But if you are trying to consistently stream all of that data that sensors are collecting, there's just no way to keep up with it. So you have to take on some risk and just know that that's what the mission will now require with volumes of data growing as fast as it is. Great, thanks for that. Up. Dr. Vega, any cl clinical considerations? Yeah, absolutely. You, for me, I, th I think of it, it'd be the equivalent, If so if we don't move in this direction, right? It'd be equivalent of your Apple Watch or your Fitbit saying it's going to track the calories, but then not actually telling you how many calories you burned. So what, right? I mean, so I think it becomes really important for us to do two things in the clinical realm. Understand what data is meaningful, and then simultaneously, how do we convert that into something that's actionable and, and intelligent, right? So that the patient can be at the center of the decision-making if it's being pushed to them or the clinician or you know, the family, whatever it may be, the caregivers or whatnot. But, but there's gonna be so much of this that is going to be produced outside of the walls of the hospital. I mean, I think this is coming, right? I mean, it's, we were seeing it today, but you know, what we're gonna be able to do over the next decade that doesn't rely on being on the walls of the hospital means that this type of sensitive data has to exist where the patient is. Uh, and I think it's going to be incumbent upon us to do so in a meaningful way. And I go back to that practical, you know, the practicality of it. Uh, but it's like, the, you know, the Fitbit, if it you know, tells me it's going to track my calories and just says you burn calories, that's not very helpful, right? Um, so I think, you know, we're going to have to sort of continue to push that envelope. Uh, and it's going to be absolutely necessary, particularly in healthcare. Thanks. Thanks for that analogy on the Fitbit. Definitely something uh, folks can relate to. Uh, Scott, how about you? I'd say the data, obviously, you know, residing on the edge, we have to secure it, and, and it's critical that uh, we do so in a, in a, a manner that doesn't uh, allow it to be exfiltrated or anything like that. But it's also about the uh, decision making and how do you act on that data? What do you do with that data? And can we push some of that decision making that, you know, like we were talking about earlier, AI and those types of things to the edge to take action on the data uh, as it resides in the edge, not just having the data on the edge, but uh, making determinations and decisions based on the data at the edge versus having to send it back to a centralized repository or centralized system for that decision making. So I'm excited about what can be done uh, in that aspect, uh, especially if we can have those things happen um, you know, on the devices we mentioned earlier, the devices are very powerful today compared to what they used to be. Uh, so there's a lot more capability there. And I just see that whole, you know, we talked about centralized, decentralized. I, I see, you know, the push for the decentralization and those things, you know, not just data, but also decision making being pushed to the edge as well. Thanks, Mark. That's great, Scott. Yeah, really, really something to consider as far as uh, not just the data coming to the edge. Um, I really appreciated that answer. And thank you so much, everybody, for um, a, a really great conversation and panel uh, this afternoon. It was it was really wonderful to get the perspectives um, from both the federal healthcare realm, um, emergency management, acquisition, and the private sector. Um, really, really a great panel. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Dr. Vega. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Matab. Um, we're really excited to bring this uh, event to folks and excited to see where 5G takes us over the next couple of years. Thank you.